listening to the Read Aloud Revival Podcast. This is the podcast that inspires you to build your family culture around books. Hey there, friends. Sarah McKenzie here, and you're listening to episode 19. I am so grateful for all of you who've been leaving reviews in iTunes. Wow, thank you so much. I love reading those. I've read every single one. And every time you leave a rating or review, it just helps the podcast get in front of more eyeballs. Haley and Sarah are the writers behind Aslan's Library, a blog dedicated to beautiful and true theological books for kids. Longtime friends and book lovers, Haley and Sarah share a concern for excellence in books for kids and lament that the best ones are often hard to find. To remedy that, they started a blog in 2010 to share their own book selections with others and to begin a conversation about the importance of truth and beauty in children's books. I invited them on the show today to talk about reading with toddlers, which is something that requires its own kind of fortitude, I think. Hi, Haley. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the show. Hi, Sarah. Thanks. Haley, do you want to tell us a little bit about your family before we get started? Sure. I live in Minnesota with my husband and three kids. I have a daughter who's five and my sons are two and almost five months. And I have been at home with them since my daughter was born and she is five and a half now and we're just starting in on the homeschooling journey. So we've got all sorts of things going on. Yeah. Exciting. That's an exciting time when you're just at the very beginning, I think. Yeah, it is. And Sarah, what about your family? Well, I live in San Francisco, California with my husband and two kids. My oldest is my daughter who is seven, almost eight actually. And my son is four and my daughter's in second grade. We're actually at a local charter school and my son is in preschool. And so we've been having a great time living in San Francisco and navigating how to keep reading when things like homework and violin lessons and gymnastics and soccer all start right, crowding that, in. That kind of adds its own dimension of juggling, right? Juggling all the yes. priorities. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I love the name of your blog, Aslan's Library. So Sarah, do you want to tell us how you chose Aslan's Library and what you share there? Sure. Well, Haley actually chose the name, so I'll let her share a little about where that came from. But I can tell you how we got started. When our daughters were both very small, we were in a book club together for a long time, and Haley and I are both inveterate lovers of lists. We both had book lists for um, possible reading with our book club and book lists of books we wanted to read with our children, and we both had, you know, Honey for a Child's Heart and Books Children Love and all of these wonderful resources. We realized we didn't have anything like that for explicitly theological books, books for teaching our kids about faith. And so as we were tossing, we would constantly toss ideas back and forth. And finally, we thought, you know, we should actually write about this because we've actually got sort of a stable here of lots of really great books. And there just isn't that same kind of resource for explicitly theological books out there. Right. I don't think I've seen anything. So, And then Haley had the brilliant idea of naming the blog Aslan's Library. Yes. Tell me about that, Haley. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think we landed on that because we were sort of drawn to the idea of thinking about this project as building a list of books that maybe C.S. Lewis might put his stamp of approval on or even taking it one step further, books that we might actually find in Narnia, maybe in Aslan's own library. I think it was just a way, it was an image that helped us keep in mind the standard of books we were searching for. I love that. I love that whole stand that it's like a very poetic standard. I love that. (laughs) So one of the things I hear about constantly is that Christian parents especially are concerned with the underlying themes and messages in books. And I know that I have a hard time previewing all the books my kids are reading, and I just can't quite manage to stay ahead of them. And so I wonder if we could chat a little bit about the importance of truth and beauty in books and why it's a good idea to, you know, if you can't necessarily preview them all, maybe having a good book list to work from or why it's good to have a standard like you talk about with Aslan's library. So does either of you want to talk about that a little bit? For me, much of what it comes down to is respect for children. And for their minds, they really are, they're capable of moral discernment. It, you know, it differs, of course, as they grow, but they're capable of really rich emotional experiences. And I mean, one thing anyone who spent time with kids knows, 
knows that, I mean, they really want to know what really is the case, what really is true. And they're drawn to things that they find good and beautiful. Of course, they also, I think C.S. Lewis says in uh, The Abolition of Man, he talks about how children also need to be trained to, they have these passions and they have these loves that they want to put on things and they need to be trained to really know the good and love the good and see what is true. And when they do, they'll respond to that. And so I feel like, I mean, pragmatically speaking, there's just so much time for reading in life. And so as much as possible, I'd like to give my kids really meaty, nutritious stuff that respects them as people. And I think, I mean, thinking about beauty, it's more than just sort of pretty illustrations. I think about the beauty of the crafted words, care with which the book has been put together and made. And I think there's something about a truly beautiful and well-made book that we can enjoy and we can linger in, but it also, we come back to it over and over again because it does, it can confront us and stretch us in some ways. And I think that's a process that children respond to. And I think it's, it's just one more piece of my parenting. Right. I think it's really interesting that it seems like today we're all very concerned about the kind of food that our children put in their mm-hmm. bodies, but the kind mm-hmm. of food that they put in their hearts and their minds. Sometimes it's this idea of as long as they're reading, it doesn't matter what they're reading. At least they're reading kind of thing. It just drives me, right. it kind of drives me crazy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. I don't, I mean, and we, you know, we've had teachers at school who have said that. And I understand it when you're struggling with literacy and you're struggling just to get kids to sit with a book. But I think, I mean, if we really respect them and honor them, they're capable of so much more and they, right. they really do want so much more. Well, and it kind of all, then it reminds me your comment about coming back to books that have been created really lovingly with such beauty and infused with truth. I know C.S. Lewis has this quote that's a children's story that can only be enjoyed by children is not a good children's story in the slightest. And I love that because that's so true. You know, the children's books that we read that we just cringe the whole time we're reading. Yeah, those aren't good. (laughs) They're not even good for our kids. (laughs) And so that's such a good litmus test. I think if you can get lost on the prairie with Laura, then that right there is a good indicator that you're onto something, you know? Absolutely. What makes for a truly excellent book for a young child? When you talk about standards, what kind of standards are you you looking for? You mentioned beautiful illustrations and well-crafted words. Anything else? Yeah. I mean, this is probably stating the obvious, but books for very young children especially are always going to be read aloud. So it's really important that they're actually enjoyable to be read aloud, right? So the language is important. The cadence of the words is important. Illustrations that you actually want to look at, like you were saying, the best book is one that is going to be loved by the adult as well as by the child. I think that our genuine excitement and delight in a book as adults communicates just as much to the children as the book itself. And the other side of that coin is if you're reading a book to a child, even though it might have some objective, it might be a good book, but if it's not drawing you in specifically, or the read aloud experience isn't going to have as much life in it if you don't love it. So I you can make a really good argument for just sticking with books that you specifically love. Oh, I so um, agree. Yeah. You know, there's so many books out there and there's some really great book lists, but there's really no reason to read a book that you don't like yourself because there's just so many out there. You're never going to get to all of them anyway. You might as well choose ones that that you're going to enjoy as well as your children because that, like I said, that communicates to them as well. Oh, I so agree with that. And I think that's really helpful to remember when we're looking at book lists because Sometimes I think we look at a book list and we think they're like rules or it's a master that we have to follow. And if we don't enjoy reading something on there or we're not reading something on the list, we're failing in some way. But I think it's really, really helpful to keep in mind that our kids totally, at least I know my kids totally can tell when I'm reading something and just not enjoying it at all. Reading aloud to young children can be particularly difficult. I mean, the kids are all so different. I know I've had kids that mostly eat books when they're toddlers (laughs) and the other ones that, you know, won't sit still and other ones that look very, very engaged, but it can be kind of tricky as the parent to read aloud to really young children. So I am curious what reading aloud to very young children looks like in each of your homes. So Haley, do you want to start with that one? Well, I have a baby and a toddler and a five-year-old. So our house is busy and, you know, loud a lot of the time. (laughs) So we do enjoy a lot of really wonderful time around books, but you know, sometimes it just, 
kind of falls apart too. <laughs> you know, I'll say, I think it's a great time for a read aloud and my kids would respectfully disagree or my two-year-old decides he needs to be read to right now, but it happens to be 5 p.m. and I'm trying to get dinner on the table. So I think for me, I just, just try to go with the flow and try to keep the connection between books and joy. So if it's not working, just for whatever reason, just to let it go. I will say with young kids, something that I read years and years ago, I think it was from the Read Aloud Handbook by Jim Trelease. Mm -hmm. If you're familiar with that, he talks in there about like babies and toddlers, they don't need a huge variety. And I really took that to heart. So we had, I don't know, maybe 20 board books that I thought were really, really good. And my husband and I like to read aloud and my daughter liked them. And that's kind of what we stuck to until she was probably almost two. That's and a it worked. really good idea. Yeah. Go ahead. It, Sorry. It worked. You know, it's fine. It worked really well for us. And I didn't feel the stress of we have to read everything because they don't even want to read everything when they're that age. They love the repetition and that feeds them in a particular way at those ages. So really the, the really, really young ages, we, we just stuck with our, our limited repertoire and that, that worked well. I'll also say one thing, we've just really been into audiobooks from a really young age with my kids. When my daughter was probably one, we took that stack of board books that she loved and knew by heart pretty much. And I brought it to a family Christmas gathering with my family. And I had each of my siblings and my parents record themselves reading one of the books. And that was our first introduction to audiobooks. And she was one. But there are familiar voices and familiar stories, and she would listen to them and was just enthralled with that. that so that was a brilliant idea. <laughs> and I love that you did it at a family gathering because it's not even like you sent an email out to everyone and said, please record yourself, read, get your hands on this book and record yourself reading it. And it ended up being a big project because it takes right. five minutes to read a board book at a family gathering. So if everybody does exactly. that. Oh, that's yeah. so great. And, you know, from there, probably when she was... I don't know, two or two and a half. My son is two and a half right now. They both really, I think they started with Blueberries for Sal was kind of the first one that was like a real book. I mean, the audio is only 10 or 15 minutes long, so it's not very long. Audiobooks have worked really well for my kids when they're a reading of a book that they already know. So we had read Blueberries for Sal, I don't know how many times, and they knew the story well before I gave them the audio version of it. It hasn't worked as well when I tried to introduce a new book, you know, to a two-year-old, it was just too much. But if it's a book they already know, they were able to enjoy and really listen to and engage with the audio. I wonder if Um, that's because then they already have the picture in their heads, you know, they kind of have the pictures in their minds when they're listening at that point. Yeah, that could be. Sarah, Um, what does reading aloud look like in your home? Well, when my kids were smaller, I did a lot of reading while they were in motion my older daughter, who's now almost eight, when she was a very busy toddler and has always loved reading, has always loved books, but just needed to be in motion. Mm -hmm. And so I would read, I would just sit with a stack of board books on the couch and I would read to her while she played and just let her sort of roam around the room that we were in and do her thing. And so that she was hearing the books, but she wouldn't necessarily be on my lap. And now as, as both of the kids are a little bit older, my son's four, we do do more sort of sitting, I read every day at snack time after school, usually from a chapter book, but the four-year-old can get up and wonder and it's fine. He, he'll wander over and look at the story or he'll, or look at the pictures. We're reading Little House on the Prairie right now, or he'll go off in his room and get his Legos or something. And that works. And then we save the more intense books for after he's in bed. So we're doing the Chronicles of Narnia right now with our eight or seven-year-old and we do that after his bedtime. And then we make sure every night at his bedtime, he's getting books that are kind of four-year-old exclusive because he doesn't always get those so much during the day. Right, right. Um, it's hard being the younger. <laughs> you just kind of sort of play along with everyone else. Yeah, I find that too with my little slew of children that yes. some ages just seem to get more, the books are easier to choose for them just because of the times of day that we're, we're reading yeah. or whatever. So you kind of have to yeah. be intentional to make sure nobody gets, you know, nobody slips through the cracks. <laughs> And we do do a lot of, we do audio books. I usually let the children check out one or two from the library, but it's the books that have the CD inside of them. And so they'll sit and look at the book and listen. And now that my daughter's a fluent reader, she doesn't do that so much, but the little guy still, he loves that. And so for books that he's not as familiar with, we have, our library has um, 
a big collection of William Steig books, actually, mm. being read aloud, which I just love. I mean, Dr. DeSoto, he'll just sit and, you know, gets it has a little ding and he turns the page. And we listen to a lot of Jim Weiss, too. So uh, when I'm trying to get dinner on or trying to finish Halloween costumes, I can put him in the living room with Jim Weiss and and then Jim Weiss reads to him. Oh, that's so great. And he's a much better reader than I am. So it's <laughs> he's so great. Yes. For our listeners, Jim Weiss came on the show and chatted with me in episodes four and five. And he is just an amazing storyteller and gives us some tips and tricks for reading aloud better ourselves. And then just some real inspiration for why story can make such a powerful impact on your children's lives. So I'd encourage you to go back and listen to the fourth and fifth episodes. And then, you know, William Steig, I'm pretty sure that Heidi Scovel mentioned a few books by him in her episode that I had not heard of before. So I know Dr. DeSoto, but what are some of your other William Steig favorites? We really love Brave Irene, which oh, is about that's a little- one. That's such a good book. <laughs> yeah, my daughter loves that one. And actually, I love The Magic Bone. It's just really funny. It's about a little girl who finds a little magical talking bone. And then there's, uh, I think it's a wolf. Oh, I have read wolf. that. Yeah, nah, yes. I remember that now. Okay. And he wants to eat them up and the bone is trying to save her because they're friends. And it's just really dear. I love the expressiveness of his art, but also just how well he deals with, I think, things that are like some pretty fundamental fears of childhood and manages to let kids sort of inhabit those. And I feel safe letting my kids inhabit them in his stories. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does. So what would you say to a parent who finds reading to toddlers to be really frustrating because they don't sit still or because they don't act engaged? I mean, I know what my son is not a toddler. He's nine now. And he listens better still if he's building with his Legos or playing Mm -hmm. with clay than if he's just sitting there, you know, with his hands folded in his lap. Well, I don't know if I've ever seen that, but he would. (laughs) He wouldn't (laughs) listen very well in that position. (laughs) So... I'm curious to know if either of you has something to say to a parent who feels maybe frustrated, like my child never sits still. What do I do? You know, I think what I'd say is that our relationship with our children is is more important than being able to say at the end of the day that we've read a certain number of books to them. So, you know, don't make reading a frustrating experience for either of you. If you have an 18 month old and she really doesn't want to sit still to read a book, don't make her, you know, like Sarah was saying, You can read while she's running around. You can read while she's building with blocks or eating lunch or taking a bath. So do what works. And that might change after a while. You know, children are going to grow and their their attention spans are going to grow as they mature. But just do what works so that you can continue reading. But don't stress out about what's not working. You know, love your child where they are and know that they're going to grow to love books if you love books and if you love them. So keep that connection between joy and books and it's probably all going to work out. Yeah, I really like that. And I think it's really, really important for us to remember that they are seasons because I know that for me, I tend to go global. So I'll we'll have some kind of a hiccup like, oh, we can't read aloud at mealtime anymore because mealtime's too loud. We have three toddlers right now and mealtime's mm-hmm. way too loud to be reading. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I could just go, oh my gosh, you know, I loved that time of day to read. Now we can't do it anymore. And it could be kind of a stressful thing, or I could just try and remind myself that, you know, okay, so for this season, something else is going to work. That's actually been something I've needed to remember this year because we have been reading aloud less than we ever have just because of the nature of juggling three toddlers. And well, I should say I've been reading aloud less to my older kids than I have usually done. So it's been something where I have to constantly remind myself that it's just a season and there's lots of time and there's lots of books and it will all, you know, a dedication to reading aloud and knowing that it's important and a commitment on my part to make an important part of our family life is really where where the benefit comes from, I think. So I would love to hear a couple of your favorite books for that are particularly well suited for small children. So Sarah, you talked about books by William Steig. And Haley, what would be a couple of your favorites? How long do you have? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) Well, some of the board books that were in our stack of very, very favorites were like Jamberry. We love Jamberry at our house. We love Dear Zoo, which is a lift the flap one. Mm -hmm. Each Peach Pear Plum is wonderful. You know, there's a lot of Sandra Boynton ones that are really fun for the little, little kids. Right now, my two and a half year old 
really loves Gossi. I don't know if you know Gossi. No, I'm not familiar with oh, that I at all. Gossi. Okay, you have to tell me. Gossi, G-O-S-S-E-Y or? G-O-S-S-I-E. Okay. Yeah, and there's a whole series about these little ducks, but Gossi is a gosling who wears bright red boots almost every day. And yeah, so we love Gossi at our house. Then, gosh, other ones that we love beyond board books. I think of um, the Alfie books by Shirley Hughes. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm not familiar uh, with those either. Oh, my goodness. You're, my Amazon uh, cart is going to explode. Okay. Uh, the Alfie books by Shirley Hughes are fantastic. Some of our very, very favorites. Other ones we really like. I already said Blueberries for Sal is great. Pancakes for Breakfast by Tommy DePaola is a wordless picture book that we really like. Seven Silly Eaters is a really fun one. I don't know. There's so many I could go on forever. I'm so impressed with how many you just rattled off without even thinking about it. Uh, Sarah, what are some other favorites of yours? Well, Haley gave me many books when my daughter was born. So many of those that she said, I would absolutely second. We love Frog and Toad at our house. I just love Frog and Toad. That's for maybe not toddlers, but starting around age three and four, my kids just have adored them. There's for... The Littlest Kids, there's a book called The Alphabet Room by Sarah Pinto that is a wordless book and you flip the flap for each letter and there's an illustration of something that begins with that letter and in each page, new things are added with each letter and and the arrangement of them changes and a whole story plays out and it's both of my kids have just found that fascinating. They love to sit and page through it and it has flaps, which is nice. I haven't seen that one. Okay. This is great. I'm coming up with a whole It's a beautiful book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, Richard Scarry is a perennial classic at our house. And there's a another book that's sort of a large- The Maggie book. B. The Maggie B. Oh, yes. The Maggie B. You know that book, Maggie. Sarah? No. Uh-uh. I love the Maggie. Ma- the Maggie B is my favorite. It's not a book about directly about siblings, but it's my favorite book for really little kids that displays a sibling relationship in a way that a lot of books that are directly, what's it like to have a brother or sister just kind of, it's a really beautiful book. It's the for Maggie B. Siblings. Okay. Okay. The Maggie B. Yep. And my kids love this simpler fairy tale. So Paul Galdone has a whole collection of fairy tales and I mean, Henny Penny, the gingerbread boy, the little red hen. We've read those over and over and over again. Henny Penny is wonderful because you get to just repeat all of the really silly names of the characters every page. So we always giggle our way through it. Yeah. His renditions of those are my fairy favorite. They're just um, wonderful. Yeah. They are really wonderful. So Haley, you wrote a post called Toddlers and Stories. And I'll link that in the show notes. And by the way, to everybody who's listening, your head is probably spinning with all these titles. I will link to all of these, or I will try to link to all of these (laughs) in the show notes and so that you'll be able to find them quickly and easily. So don't feel like you have to be scratching these down as we go. But Haley wrote a great post called Toddlers and Stories on the Aslan's Library blog. And I would love to talk a little bit about that. So Haley, can you tell us about that post? So... When my daughter was about two and a half started family preschool, the first thing we would do in the classroom would be sit around a circle and the teacher would do a storytelling presentation of a Bible story. So she would share a Bible story and then the children would be dismissed to find a spot in the classroom and they would be given a chance to interact with the story, to respond to what they had heard. And I had rather low expectations for this art response time going in because like I said, she was two and a half and I just convinced that it was going to really mean anything. But the first week she was, the story that we heard was the circle of the church year. It talked about the liturgical seasons and my daughter sat down and drew, drew circles. And I thought, okay, sort of a fluke, right? She's two. Kids draw circles. <laughs> right. She's two, kids draw circles, no big deal. But then the next week, the teacher shared the story of creation of the world. And my daughter sat down and drew about scribbles. But I asked her at the end, I said, tell me about your picture. She said, this is the whole world. Wow. And I thought, she is paying attention. It sort of stopped me in my tracks. And it really, I mean, just week after week, that kind of thing would happen. It would look like scribbles, but I would tell me about it. And she would tell me about the story that we had just heard. And it, it really reinforced to me, you know, I love Charlotte Mason and her educational philosophy. And she talks so much about children are persons. And it drove that true home to me, that she is being formed by the stories that she hears by the books that I give her. And it really motivated me even more than ever just to find the the best to give to her. So I think I've experienced, (laughs) I I haven't done an art response, although I'm really curious to do that with my two-year-old because she 
does pick up so much more than I think she does, especially because a lot of the time I'm reading way over her head because I'm reading to the older kids and she's just around. And then she'll say something later on that will just sort of blow me away. Like, wow, she was actually listening to that. That is amazing. So yeah. And you know, with the little kids, we don't always get to see that in that dramatic of a way that I was able to see then, but we get glimpses of it here and there, like you're saying, and we just have to trust and know that that is happening all along. We just, we just don't always see it. If we keep our eyes sealed, then they can come up with these really amazing things. And it's, it's really beautiful when that happens. So now, Sarah, you wrote a post called Reading Over Their Heads, and Mm. I'd actually like to talk about that because we're talking about how children understand or at least get a little, you know, little bits out of things that we don't even expect them to. And so how important is it for small children to understand what we're reading to them? And is there a place for reading over their heads? Sure. I mean, so the occasion of the post that I had written was that I had begun reading Five Children and It by E. Nesbitt. Oh, yes. <laughs> which is just, I mean, it's just a fantastic book. And I had yes. started reading it to my daughter and I was super excited. And then about the first chapter and I thought, no way, this is going to be a bust. This language is too complex. She's not going to be able to track everything that's happening. The humor is really subtle. We're probably just going to have to put it aside. So I came in the next night to tuck her in and reached for a different book. And she said, no, no, I, I want to read more of Five Children and It. And I thought, okay. All right, so we'll keep with it. And this happened four or five nights running until I finally thought, all right, we're committed to this book. We're doing it. And I mean, I think it's a mix. As with anything, she was getting lots of other books at that point during the day that she did understand that were at her level. And I think there are books that can be really frustrating for children if they're over their heads. So, you know, as a parent, it's always a question of discernment. But when you see your child responding to a book that you judge be a little bit difficult to them, I would say go with it. I think she was missing a lot of the details. She was missing a lot of what I found wonderful about the story, but she was just immersed in it. And a fun side note from that is after we had finished it, I got a recommendation. I told my our local bookseller, my daughter really liked this book by E. Nesbitt. Do you have any others that you would recommend? And she pointed me to a whole series by Edward Eager. Mm, yes. Which are <laughs> Just fantastic and a little bit more sort of at her level. Half magic and... Yes, yes. yes. We started with half magic and have gone... We're on the time garden right now. So we've been working our way through. But that, I think reading Five Children and It, just she realized she loves books about magic and she just got lost in it. And in fact, Sarah, I was listening to one of your podcasts and I think it might have been the very first episode. I'm sorry that I can't remember right now, but one of the things that you and your guests spoke about was language and the importance of reading aloud because it introduces children to language that they don't hear on the schoolyard. Oh, yes. That was the first episode. Yeah. Yep. It's better language than often we use at home when we're in a rush and not being careful. And I think there is something to, even if kids are not picking everything up, they're still just being bathed in this wonderful language and sort of being introduced to its possibilities. And I mean, we do that now with my son reading Laura Ingalls Wilder with him. We read The Princess and the Goblin with him when he was three and a half. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> and I mean, we, I was reading it to my daughter, but he was there. It was during, I was our snack time read. I mean, he loved it, I think, more than she did, even though he only got a fraction of it. And I saw it popping up in his imaginary play. So, I mean, I think it's a mix, of course, as with anything, you don't want to simply choose books that are over their heads, but right. <laughs> right. I don't think we should be afraid of that. I think there's some wonderful possibilities and kids are capable of more than we think. And that was a fun and surprising experience for me in our reading life. Yeah, that is really fun. Okay, so one of you, and I can't remember which now, wrote a post called Owning the Library. Was that you, Haley? Yep, that was definitely Haley. Okay, (laughs) okay. So this was a fantastic post. I shared this one on Facebook and everybody, I mean, it just, people just loved it. And I think it really struck a chord with a problem that a lot of us have with using the library, which is that, of course, kids like to read and reread, especially small children love to read and reread and reread their very, very favorite books. And so if you get a great book from the library and you give it back, you don't really have the chance to repeat it, or you may even forget about it and then not check it out again. So tell us about 
the book you made your daughter? Before I started this book for my daughter, I had been keeping a written record of our favorite books. You know, I'd write down the titles, but then one day it struck me that if this was a visual list instead of a written list of titles, my daughter could actually participate in this with me. So I spent some time and I found images of the covers of our favorite books that were at the library. And I, you know, cut and pasted it onto a Word document and had them printed up. And now she has this binder that she can open it up at any time and see all of her favorites right there. And what I do is I give her, usually I give her five sticky notes. And I say, you know, you can put the sticky note over the cover of the book that you want me to request and bring me the binder and I will request it for you so that it's there in a few days at the library to pick up. And it just worked really well for us. It's been a great way to facilitate, like you said, the rereading of books that we don't own. And it's also been a really good way to give my kids, I don't know, ownership and to to let them play a part of the book selection process without me having to worry that they're going to grab something off the library shelves that's swaddly or whatever. Everything in this book, we all love and I'm happy to get it from the library. So there's a real freedom with that. Like you can get any of these books from the library and go crazy. You know, we've all had that experience in the library where your child picks up a book and you kind of cringe and you have to decide. Yeah. You know, that is something that I've really struggled with. In episode 11, I talked to Jamie Martin about this because, wow, I've had a really hard time with my kids picking up the stuff on the library shelf that I don't want them to bring home. And it seems like a lot of the time that's what they display. So, you know, with the covers out. And so I think, ah, how are we supposed to find the good stuff? And so it's, that seems like a really good way of letting them choose books from the library without letting them choose from all the books at the library. <laughs> yeah. It really frees me up from that, from that dilemma of, okay, do I, you just, just don't have to think about it. Just say, yes, you can get it. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, we talked a little bit about book lists and just reading something that you enjoy, but maybe we could talk a little bit about, well, you have this great quote on your blog from Alan Jacobs, the pleasures of reading in an age of distraction. I have not read that, but it has officially gone onto my reading pile. He tells about how reading something true and good and beautiful can and should change your life, but then He says there's a place for what he calls reading at whim, which I just love. And that's to say, you know, reading for the pleasure of reading. And sometimes I think as mindful parents, we kind of get hung up on finding the perfect book list or, you know, the next book we read, it needs to be the right book. So we don't just launch into another book because we sort of think we want to make sure we get the right book. And so what are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on, you know, is it possible to get overly concerned with book choices? Well, I mean, you mentioned the food analogy earlier that we want to give our kids the best food. And that can lead us to some kind of crazy places if we let it. And such that, you know, we go into restaurants and we're looking at the menu and we're thinking, well, you know, how locally was this grown to my house? And should I give it to my child? And, you know, it can lead us to some difficult places to live in. And I think book lists can, can get to be the same thing. I like to use them as much as I can in a freeing way to sort of populate my imagination of what is out there to read. So then I can read at whim. I think as parents, we have a little bit of an advantage on our kids because we are their provider of books. And a few, gosh, I guess it was a few years ago now, Haley pointed me to this wonderful post by Melissa Wiley about how she strews books for her children. Oh, yes. I'll link to that. And I know what post you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful idea, right? That you sort of figure out the sorts of books or you know the sorts of books that your child likes and is interested in. And you find the books in that area that really are wonderful. And then you just leave them in a prominent place, like on their nightstand. And (laughs) I've had some great success with that. We went through a phase where my daughter only wanted to read. There's a series, I guess, if you have a first or second grader and you've been to the public library, you've probably seen them. They're these fairy books. There's like 50 or 60 of them. Oh, yes. I know what you're talking about. Because we read all all of them. Or my daughter read all of them. I'm fairly certain. (laughs) Yes. And I mean, they drove me nuts. I was like, I will not read this aloud. If you want to read them, you can. And that was fine. And Mm -hmm. that was a place where I had to let go of some of my perfectionism and say, you know what? She enjoys them. I think they're kind of twaddle, but they're not overtly offensive. And in the meantime, that was actually when we started reading The Princess and the Goblin, because I thought, this is what she's interested in. She loves magic. Let's read The Princess and the Goblin. And started leaving books like that around for her so that she could pick things up and feel the ownership of it and feel the ownership to put it down too. Yes. Without me being sort of shoving it in her face or 
taking things away. I think that's a really good point too, because people ask me all the time if I let my kids read twaddle. I do let my kids read twaddle. Like you said, as long as it's like not overly offensive or damaging to their moral imagination in some way, I do let them read things like the fairy books that I'm you're talking about. But I do not read those out loud. And so that's where I draw the line. And I think then if they hear this beautiful, rich language in good books, then it kind of builds up their thirst for really good writing. Now for my toddler, she will, I don't know how it gets into our house, but it does, you know, like the twaddly Disney licensed books and that kind of thing. And so if she'll bring something like that to me, I will read it to her. And then it is never found again. (laughs) (laughs) So I don't outright tell her, no, I'm not going to read that to you. I'll read it to her. But then it just sort of disappears because I really want to be careful that the books that we own and that we have on our shelves are really good, solid books. And Mm -hmm. I don't know how so much twaddle gets in our home, but it certainly finds its way in. But I have a feeling that we probably do our kids something of a disservice when we're so legalistic that it almost becomes like forbidden fruit to read, you know, the Babysitter's Club or something. (laughs) Yeah. And the way I... Oh, go ahead, Haley. I was just going to say, I think that developing a taste for good books is a process. And we have to be patient with our kids as they as they learn that really for themselves. And it's something that they do have to learn for themselves. We can't just impart it to them magically one day. And I think we also have to have grace because, you know, I don't, every book that I sit down with isn't a full surprise in it or something. That's think, such a good point. Yep. I think that we just have to allow a little bit of freedom. And, you know, at the end of the day, I don't want to be the uh, library killjoy in my house. You know, right. I don't want to never be following my child's interests. I want to be a good guide for them, but I also want to be a friendly guide. (laughs) Right. Yes. A good guide, but a friendly guide. I like that. (laughs) I mean, that's one of the lovely things about the library versus owning books. We wrote some posts a while back about why you should buy books, why you should own books, or why you should own books, and then why you should use the library as well. And I'm a little more free with what comes home from the library because it's going to go back. Exactly. And the way I talk about the books that we buy, especially, I mean, when we go into our, we've got a lovely little local independent bookshop and they always have whatever the most, they have beautifully displayed books, but they always have a small display of whatever the most recent Disney movie is, Mm -hmm. which is fine. Not, you know, but what I always tell my kids is, you know, we just, we live in a not super huge house and we don't have that much space. And so I want to be careful with our space. And if you see that book at the library, fine. But for what we, and and that helps me talk about owning books in a way that isn't, I hope, quite so killjoy. Yeah, right. You know, it's like inviting friends into your home or it's having people live with you. You know, we want these people that we want to share our lives with certain books and others we just have over for dinner. Yes, that's so (laughs) great. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) That's great. Well, I want to honor your time. I'm so grateful for the time that you've offered to spend with us here. But before we go, I want to make sure I ask you the question, my favorite question to ask everybody, which is if you were on a deserted island and could only bring with your family and you could only bring three books with you, what would make the cut? And I am really interested in hearing your answers because you both have spouted a zillion books this episode. So I'm curious to know if you can actually whittle it down to three. (laughs) So Haley, do you want to start? Gosh, well... I can't overthink this question or else it just becomes impossible. And I think I'm going to narrow it just to fiction because if you get to nonfiction, then I want to start looking at books that are like how to get yourself off of a stranded island, and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> so if I say just fiction, I think I definitely want a picture book for my kids. And one of my very favorite picture books that we have is called The Complete Brambly Hedge by Jill Barkland. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. And it's out of print, so it's actually one of my most treasured books because I love it so much. So I think that is one that I would take. And, you know, my blog is called Aslan's Library, so I sort of have to say the Chronicles of Narnia. (laughs) I haven't read them with my kids yet, so if we're going to be on a stranded island, I feel like that's sort of essential childhood reading. Yes, definitely. I'm going to say Narnia, Chronicles of Narnia, and I do have a one volume, so I'm not cheating. Uh, (laughs) Close, but okay. (laughs) And then, you know, right now what I'm reading with my book club is The Bird in the Tree. Are you, are you familiar with that? No. Uh-uh. It's a, I think the trilogy is called like the Elliott Family Trilogy. It's written by a woman called Elizabeth Googe. I think is how you say her last name. Oh, yes. I've heard of her, but I haven't read anything of hers yet. Yeah. And, you know, I haven't finished it, but I am thoroughly engrossed. 
And if I was, you were going to plunk me on a desert island, I would really be wondering what happened. So I think because you asked me today, I'm going to have to say the bird in the tree. And if you let me sneak in the, the two um, sequels, I would. I'd, <laughs> <laughs> Just pushing it there. I know. <laughs> okay, Sarah, what about you? Well, I think I did overthink this because I thought, well, am I stranded for the rest of my life and the rest of my children's lives? Or are we just there for a few months? If it's for, you know, short term, then I mean, either way, I think the Bible, just because that's, I mean, aside from devotional purposes, it's just such a rich literary creation. Um, And I think the foundation of so much of how we use the English language. So I would have that you know, if my kids are going to be 10 or 11, by the time we get off, I would take the Alfie books or not the Alfie books. We have a big collected selection of Alfie stories by Shirley Hughes and probably The Hobbit because that would keep us occupied until the boat arrived. Oh, good. And then we'd come find you so you could read it aloud to my kids. I was just going to say, can I please request to be on the same island as Sarah? (laughs) Yeah. Then we could have double the books, right? It would work. (laughs) Oh, that's hilarious. Excellent. (laughs) Excellent. But if I had to stay for a long time, if I'm going to be there with my children through their teenage years... I would still keep the Bible, but I would also take the Kristen Lovren's Daughter trilogy, oh, Yes, uh-huh. which I have in one collected work, so it would count. I think both boys and girls ought to read that in their late teens. It's just such a such a fantastic So book. the translation, the Tina and Anneli translation? Yes, okay. absolutely. Yep. Okay, so here's the thing. I So many people recommended it to me about two years ago, and I'd never heard of it before, and I thought, I'm going to get it. So I went to the library, I picked up a copy, and I thought, Wow, how am I going to get through this thing? Because mm. it was reading like a King James yes. Bible, but it's long. And I thought yeah. this is not going to work. I don't. I read two thirds of it, and then just sort of like uh, exhaustion, totally. <laughs> I burnt out. And then I realized much later, oh my goodness, there's a different translation. So I got it. It's sitting on my shelf to read. I just haven't started it yet, but. It's just wonderful. And the Tina Nunali, from what I understand, is actually more faithful to the the actual Norwegian. I don't think it was written in an archaic tone. I think that translator gave it the archaic tone to make it seem old. Oh, interesting. It took place in the 14th century. So that's interesting. Hmm, Yeah. So I would take that and I would take the Lord of the Rings. Um, The Lord of the Rings. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. (laughs) You could read that one, those two, to my (laughs) crew. Now it's time for Let the Kids Speak. This is my favorite part of the podcast, where kids tell us about their favorite stories that have been read aloud to them. Hi, my name is Daisy. I'm 13 years old, and I'm from Minnesota. My favorite book my mom has read aloud to me is The Giver by Lois Lowry. I liked this book because I always wanted to know what was going to happen next. Thanks. Hi, I'm MJ. I'm 10 years old, and I'm from Minnesota. The read aloud that I'm enjoying right now is Brother Andrew, which is one of the Christian hero books. I liked hearing about the Nazis invading Holland and that Andrew wanted to make a difference. Hi, my name is Margaret. I live in Waco, Texas. My favorite read aloud that my mom and dad read to me is Paddle to the Sea. I like it because it's a really cool adventure and it also helps me with my biography. Geography. And I'm her sister, Stella. And I like when my mama reads me the book that my daddy got me, Star Wars. And we like all together doing puzzles. The show notes for this episode of the podcast are, as I'm sure you can imagine, jam-packed with awesome book recommendations from Sarah and Haley. So just for fun, I'm going to give away a $25 Amazon gift card to one random commenter at the show notes. So to get your chance to win and be able to pick up a couple of those books that they recommend that sounds so awesome, head to readaloudrevival.com and click on episode 19. That's all I've got today, but until next time, go build your family culture around books. Mm